Well, good morning. It's good to be here today. Uh, real quick, let's have, if you're a guest, a student, parent, if you're probably like your little sister or brother, I don't know, whoever came with you, would you guys just stand real quick so we could just welcome you? Go ahead and stand up. Go ahead. It's okay. They're like, what's going on? You're fine. It's good. There you go. Go ahead and stand up. Give them a hand. Thank you guys for coming. All right. Thank you guys so much. No, wait, wait. I didn't tell you to sit. No, I'm just kidding. You're fine. You're fine. I'm just kidding. You're good. You're good. So, uh, when I was, uh, I, I was helping run a junior high uh, camp, and they gave us the option. We got to vote what sort of activities we wanted to do, right? And I voted for anything that would us, you know, just required us sitting in the cabins and eating, right? Like, I just, I, I and, and they, one of the options was we could go swimming. One of them was that we could uh, do like this paintball adventure thing. Uh, one of them was a, a, a low ropes leadership chorus thing, whatever that is. And, and then one of them was high ropes, right? And so if, you, if you've heard me speak, you know me at all, you know, um, you know, my three biggest fears are um, heights, uh, needles and clowns, right? Uh, so like a clown with a needle on a high wire is pretty much an epitome of everything that I, in my life that I just don't want a piece of, right? I, uh, I used to say in commitment, um, and I would say a clown on a high wire with a needle in a wedding dress, but then I got married and I had to cut that part, right? And so, um, so, so, so they're like, dude, let's do the high ropes. And I'm like, dude, you guys are idiots. We're all gonna die. You know, this is the worst. And they're like, it's gonna be great. We go up. And so, so we go and they give us the session and they tell us, you know, you gotta put on this little belt thing and tie it on and hook it in and you climb up the stuff. And so I watched the first couple kids go and they're like, Aaron, dude, it's your turn. And I'm like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm a good encourager. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm just gonna clap. Can I just be a cheerleader? Like, is that allowed? And they're like, no, you know, and so they're like, you, because kids hate you and they want to see you die, right? And so I'm like, you know, like, sure. And so they, they're like, go on. And so the first thing was like this log and it was like up like that, right? And so you have to walk up this stupid log and you get done, you know, and I, I, I had felt accomplished, you know, I made it all the way up uh, and it only took about 32 minutes. And, and so, so I'm up and I look and they're like, now you got to cross this bridge. And it's like this Indiana Jones bridge of death, right? Um, like, why would you ever make a bridge that moves? That's, that's just cruel, right? And so it's moving, and I'm walking across, and then they take planks out, right? Because they're just horrible people, right? And so we're, we're walking across, and we finally make it, and then it goes to the, the very last thing that, uh, uh, before, before the final. And, and, and uh, it's, it, was a, it was a rope that you walked across, and it had two wires that went like this. And as you held on to one of the wires, eventually when you got to the middle, you had to make a transfer from the first wire to the second wire. And somewhere mid-transfer, I lost my grip. And, and as happens, you know, this is pretty normal, right? In high ropes, apparently, uh, people fall. And, and I fell. And through my... Uh, ninja skills, I was able to grab on to the rope under me, all right? Because I know kung fu. <laughs> Noises. Yeah. Hwa! Hit! Right? And so, uh, so I'm yelling, and I'm falling, and my entire life is flashing before my eyes, right? Uh, which wasn't very long, so I wasn't impressed. Uh, and so I'm falling. I'm holding on with my leg. I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. And then finally, I pull myself back up. And as I pull myself back up, I feel something doesn't feel right. And I look down, and the harness that was supposed to be holding me up had now fallen. And it was around my ankles. And I was hanging on 3,500 feet in the air. Okay, it wasn't that big. All right, it was, it, it was, it was probably about 30 feet uh, in the air, holding on, knowing that my harness fell. And now, like, I don't want to freak out, right? I don't want to scare the, the other people that are coming after me because they deserve this too. And so I don't, I don't know what to say. And so I look down and there's a girl under me and I'm like, ma'am, ma'am. And she's like, yes. I'm like, I, my harness, it's not, it's not working. She's like, sir, I can't hear you. You're going to have to speak up, you know? And, and I'm like, I, my, my harness isn't, isn't working. And she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, it's on my ankles. And this is what she says. Oh no. <laughs> like there are places you don't want to hear, oh no, right? You don't want to hear, oh no, at the dentist office. You know, like that's just not a word you want to hear. Um, you don't want to hear, oh no, when you turn in your final exam in a couple weeks and the professor's like, oh no, right? You don't want that? You don't want that? 
And you certainly don't want that when the person that's supposed to be protecting you is down 30 feet under you. And so they say, don't move. And I go, no problem, right? I can handle that one. And then out of nowhere, my hero shows up. I, I don't know this girl's name. I don't know who she is, but, but she like spider woman in there. It was unbelievable. She was like swinging, flinging web, hooking herself on. She was like, fruh, fruh, pop, and she just lands beside me. And I'm like, can you teach me that? Like, and so then she looks at my harness, and this is what she says. Oh, no. I'm like, yeah, I've been getting a lot of that recently. She's like, here's the deal. Because of where it is and what's going on, I, I can't fix it here. And so what I'm going to need you to do is hold on to the wire. And, and, they, and they brought this little thing I could put my foot in. And they said, we're going to need you to crawl back to the side. And I was like, okay. And she's like, when you get to the side, we're going to need you to grab on to the ledge and pull yourself up and then do a 180 and sit down. Okay. Um. And then I asked this question. I said, do, do they drug test here? And she's like, no. And I was like, I didn't think so because you are on crack if you think I can do that. She's like, no, no, no. It's got it happen. It's got it. So she gets me and, and she pulls me over and I get there and, and, and through trial and error and prayer and the grace and mercy of God, I pull myself up. And she's like, now I'm going to have to get a little close to put this on you. And I was like, darling, you can kiss me if you can fix this. Right? I don't care. Like you do what you have to do, right? And so she puts it on and she's like, okay, now I got to do is, is go down the zip line. And I, I, I hook onto the zip line. And man, when I hit the ground, they, they, there, was, there is nothing that I can, I cannot express anything that I have ever seen that's more beautiful, except for my wife and daughter who are here today. Other than those two things, I cannot, I know, right? She's cute, right? I, I can, there's nothing that I have loved more than the moment I saw that ground, because it was everything that I, it was my safety, it was my security, it was the foundation and bedrock of existence. Here's what I know, the ground doesn't fall away, the ground doesn't move, unless you're in California, and we don't want to talk about that, right? That, that you're, you're there, and it's set, and it's solid, it is foundational, and all the stuff that felt crazy, and all the stuff that felt scary, None of that mattered anymore because I had a hold onto the thing that was going to keep me safe. And in the book of Corinthians, chapter 15, Paul describes this to the congregation that he's writing to. This is early, early on in Paul's ministries. He says, listen, there's, Paul consistently is writing to churches and saying, look, there's stuff going bad. There's stuff going wrong. There's things in your life you don't understand. There's frustration. There's pain. There's anger. There's disappointment. But he says, if you will cling to this, it is the very gift of life. If you'll hold on to this, this is your foundation. This is your bedrock. When you question everything else, don't question this. When you've thrown everything else away, hold on to this. When you've been dealt disappointments and frustrations, when you're angry, when you're sad, when your faith has been shaken, you can stand on this. And this is what he says. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you now have taken your stand. It is by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to this word with I preach to you, otherwise you believe in vain. It is that which I received, which I passed on to you as the utmost, as the first, as the primary importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of which who are now still living. And then he appeared to James and the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. He said, if everything else is burned away, if everything else is set aside. If you'll hold on to this, it's going to be okay. 
as I made my way through high school and entered into college, I did what a lot of young people do. I started to deconstruct certain pieces of my faith. I wasn't sure what I believed, how I believed. Most of you know I have a younger sister who has Down syndrome. Every day, from the moment I understood what that meant, until I was about 17, I would pray for God to heal my sister. And it never happened. When I was 16 years old, I started having headaches, and my throat was getting sore. And as I went to the doctor, what they found is I had a tumor here and a tumor here, one of which was starting to move into my skull. The other one was wrapping itself around my vocal cords. My white blood cell count was through the roof. Every test they did confirmed more and more and more. They said, listen, uh, we, don't, we won't know for sure until we go in for surgery, but we can just tell you with a pretty high percentage chance that you have cancer. And I remember walking down the aisle at my church and kneeling down and being anointed by my father and by elders in the church and other people that love me. And I went into surgery on Monday. And Thursday when I went back, this is what they told me. They said, Aaron, we don't know what happened. We're not sure what this looks like, but all the tests that we ran before are coming back negative. Everything that you've had before doesn't seem to be there. But instead of joy, my question was, God, if you can do this for me, why haven't you done it for her? She's a better Christian than I am today. She serves more, she cares more, she loves better. And so instead of enjoying the fact that God has somehow supernaturally, miraculously showed up into my life, what I did is I started to question what sort of God was I serving? Around that same time was when Columbine happened. Now, that's not as big of a deal now. Seems like we have a new school shooting once a week. But for, for my era, for my generation, this was a big deal. And I remember hearing about one particular girl who was asked if she was a Christian, and when she said yes, she was shot. And I started to question God. I said, God, how could you allow this to happen? If it was me, and I would have said yes, would you have allowed me to die? And I think— there was too much order in the world for me to question whether or not there was a deity. I, I, I've always believed in, in the idea of the divine. But what I really started to question was what kind of God was I serving? And then I got to college and slowly, but surely, I started taking a sledgehammer to my faith. And by the time that I was done, I had one thing left. Jesus. I couldn't get away from him. He was too fascinating. I was too intrigued. There was something about Jesus that appealed to me. And as I read through this passage, in Corinthians, what I find is that it was probably at that moment that my real faith started. There's a lot of important things in Christianity. There's a lot of stuff that, that, that we believe that matters and is important, but when it comes down to it, what truly matters is the gospel. This is what Paul is saying. I am, the, the words he uses actually, I am gospeling the gospel to you. Let me gospel the gospel. Let me proclaim to you this good news. The, the gospel in this culture, what was what would happen is some, if someone was an evangelist, right? When we think of evangelists now, we think of th different things, right? We, we, think of, we think of individuals on TV, we, with, with kind of weird hair and, and their wives wear too much makeup and, and, and they grunt a lot, right? You know what I'm, you, did you, have you ever seen those? Am I the only one? Do you know what I'm, and, ah, right? And sometimes they stomp, right? They're, they're, they're things, right? That's, that's what, that's, we, or we think of somebody who's standing on the street or, or telling everyone that maybe they're going to hell or, or maybe someone that, that's holding a John 3.16 sign at a, at a baseball game. That, but, but what an evangelist in that culture was actually a political position, an evangelist was someone who was going out to the cities and the providences of Rome and letting them know the good news of Rome. 
And this is what they would say. They would set up camp and they would call everyone out and they say, let me tell you the good news that the Caesar is God. And it is only through the name of Caesar that men shall be saved. Does that sound familiar? And so for Jesus and for the disciples to come in and call themselves evangelists, the good news bearer, the gospel holders, they were bringing the good news that there was a different kingdom. There was a kingdom other than the kingdom of Rome. And the real savior was not found in, in, in Caesar. The real savior was not found in Rome. The real savior was not found in this political setup or the empire. The real savior was found under the name of Jesus Christ, without which no man shall be saved. And that God is pursuing us for everything he is worth. I, uh, I could take you back to the place in Deddy Chapel the first time I met or saw my wife, Shara. I was playing guitar back in this corner. She was sitting about four rows up from the back with her family. And as I'm standing there playing guitar, I looked up, and I just remember thinking, she is smoking hot. I mean, you can look, it's okay. <laughs> just girls, you boys keep your heads up this way. Right? It, it, that's what I remember thinking. And I go back now. Shara, unfortunately, doesn't remember that meeting. I actually spoke to her. I shook her hand. I asked her if she was coming to, uh, to school here. She said no. Her brother was coming. She was here for a visit. And, and then she just sort of kind of smiled, waved, and left. She, can, she met my father three minutes later. She remembers what my father said, what my father looked like. She remembers a sweater my dad was wearing. <laughs> so she ended up showing up. She was working in admissions. She started taking some classes. And, and when, I, when I saw her, I realized that I just wanted to be every place she was at. And thankfully, Facebook had been invented, so I knew. <laughs> right? <laughs> www.stalkersrus, right? Like, <laughs> she went to lunch. I showed up at lunch. She went to a ball game. I showed up at a ball game. Her and her friends went out to dinner. I showed up at dinner. <laughs> Sometimes I just show up at their table. Hey, how's everybody thinking? And she would just roll her eyes, right? I just decided I was going to be every place she was at. She, I, you may call that stalking. I called that pursuing. <laughs> and what? And eventually, I think what she figured out was, if he's going to be every place I'm at anyways, I might as well marry the guy, right? Like, just make it official. And she did. And it was a, but it was a nonstop, I was, I, was, I was consumed with the idea. And the more we met, the more I knew about her, the more in love with her I fell. And eight years later, I am still a student of my wife pursuing her learning about her, loving her. And what the gospel here tells us is we serve a God who pursues us. There's a song out right now that some of the language is called Some Controversy, The Reckless Love of God. I think it's one of the best songs on provenient grace that's been written in a very long time. Let me start there. And let me say this. The God that I know pursues us knowing that the way it was going to happen was death to himself. That sounds like a reckless act. We serve a God that comes in the flesh. Our gospel is not simply that Jesus died. If we are not careful, we have minimized the gospel that Jesus could have been born in a virgin and then died the next day and everything would be fine. Right? When we, when we talk about the gospel, oftentimes what we talk about is, what is the gospel? Uh, God created perfection, man screwed up, Jesus died, now we can go to heaven. 
And the problem with that sort of gospel is it sells short what God wants to do right now in our lives. That sort of gospel doesn't sound like the gospel Paul is talking about. Paul says, let's start first that Jesus came and he lived. The life of Jesus is part of the gospel. That when Jesus showed up, the, the image we always get when we talk about the gospel a lot of time, and maybe you've seen this, is there's a man standing here and there's this big gulf, right? And the man can't get to God because there's this big gap. And so then the cross falls and now man can make it over. And, and the problem with that is it, it's not really scriptural because what the cross did, the cross wasn't just a way for us to get to God. The cross was God saying, you'll never be able to get over the gap. I'm going to break into your reality. It was God pursuing us even unto death. It was God coming and living like us and living with us and becoming one of us so that we could eventually become like him. Guys, the gospels aren't about Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. That's what Paul's saying. That the gospel isn't just something we talk about. It's something we live with the very presence of God. We're, we're really good, I think, at, at talking about the transcendence of God, right? God's big. Did you guys sing that song as a kid? My God is so big, so strong, so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Did you guys do that? S sing it with me, if you, right? Our God is so, so... So, good, good, good. Yeah, good job. And you do the claps, right? Yeah, the good, the, those, right. Or was it just us charismatic church? Okay, anyway, so, <laughs> you were like, well, we clapped, but only up here, right? Like, okay. Did you guys do the motions? The mo everyone had, right? The, right? the problem with that sort of theology is we t when we talk about God who is big and who is strong and who is mighty, the, the problem is we talk about a God that is so other than us that we cannot relate to. We talk about a God that is so big and so transcendent and so amazingly glorious and holy that there's no way we can ever comprehend him. And so we just sort of, we're just sort of these little worms down here that try, but nothing we can do. And the fact of the matter is that's a part of Christianity and it's certainly orthodoxy that God is transcendent, but God is an imminent God who wants to be involved in your life right now at this very moment. He wants to know you and be known by you. He wants to engage with you. And the gospel is that Jesus showed up and walked among us to be a part of us, to engage with us. And then he died. He died taking on the weight of the sin of the world. And if our story ends there, it's a horrible story. He tried, he failed. But then three days later, he comes back. And with his resurrection, death has been defeated, and the kingdom of God has started. And you and I, when we place our faith in Christ, are becoming a part of that kingdom here on earth. The gospel is not simply a ticket to that you can go to heaven. The gospel is that God wants to bring heaven to earth. I mean, the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in, hallowed be thy, thy kingdom, thy will be on as it is in. Now, it doesn't say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, please kill me now so I can get to heaven. Now, during finals week, we may feel like that, right? Some of you are going, that doesn't sound so bad, Aaron. That's a pretty good gospel. You haven't had systematic at 750, all right? Like, you don't know. The test is coming. I get it. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not escapism. If you want escapism, become a Buddhist. The foundation of our faith, the bedrock through which we stand, is that Christ came not just to bring you into heaven, but to usher heaven into earth. And that he was resurrected to show us that death was not our final destination. That we didn't have to be scared of death anymore because we were living life now. The gospel is just as much about life before death as it is life after. That we could have life and we could have it to the fullest. And that when God shows up, things change. That when God interacts with you, life looks 
different. There are certain moments in life that shape us that we will never experience before and that will change us for the rest of our lives. The college you pick starts to shape your life for the rest of your life. The spouse that you pick starts to change your life for the rest of your life. Everyone told me, oh, once you have a baby, everything will change. And I, 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 I didn't understand that and, and until we had a baby. And when I say we had a baby, I mean Cher had it. I say it in the same way like we won a national championship, right? I, I had very little to do. I clapped while, you know, she was doing her thing, but I, like, we had a baby. She had a baby. I, I cheered. <laughs> Tip, guys, by the way, um, cheering too loud during that apparently is also gets you in trouble. There's a very specific range of cheering that you're allowed to do. Um, if you don't cheer enough, you don't appreciate it. If you cheer too much, you don't understand her pain. Somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot of cheering. Um, toe touches are not appropriate in the labor and delivery room from personal experience. You don't think I can do a toe touch. I can see it. I can. Do not do that in the labor delivery room. Your wife will not appreciate it. <laughs> Pom-poms also not appropriate. Listen, when we had a baby, everything looked different. Right now, right now, get all the sleep that you can because when you have a baby, you are gonna apologize to sleep for the way you treated it in college. You're gonna say, sleep, I am so sorry, I miss you. It was me, not you, I love you, come back. Right? You're gonna watch that. You're gonna learn. You're gonna learn. You're gonna learn Veggie Tale movies. You're gonna know every word to every stupid song. You're not gonna watch the type of movies you used to watch anymore, right? And you're gonna have little tea parties where you have to wear a crown and sometimes glitter. And you're going to wonder how you ever lived life before that. Because there are some moments in life that change us so profoundly that our entire nature shifts. And when the kingdom of God shows up, everything about us shifts. We start to reorient our life towards him. We start to live like him. We start to look like him. We start to love like him. And if I could leave you with one thing, if there was one lesson, one last lecture, it is that Jesus is the gospel and everything we do has to be built on that. Anything that doesn't look like him, any actions that don't live like him, any aspects that don't love like him have to be removed. And, and not the just type of removal that's a tweak, not the type of removal that just sort of a, 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 a gloss over, the type of removal that transforms. I, uh, when I lived with my parents, we would go to my grandmother's house to watch football games. And Ohio State was playing, I won't desecrate this holy place with the name, but it's a state up north. <laughs> and they were playing a game that weekend, and my grandmother had said she was going to make chili. So what she asked me to do, my job, was to get seven tubes of hamburger to her house. So I went to our freezer, I got seven tubes, I put them in a bag, put them in the back of our car. I got my dog Zoe, and we drove over to my grandmother's house. Zoe sat in the back. <laughs> Zoe's a good dog, all right? Don't judge Zoe before you know her. So I took out the hamburger from the bag, and I placed it in the freezer, and I drove to church, because it was Wednesday night church, 
And if you, if, if you knew the Duvall family at all, Duvalls leave their cars at their place of work all the time. Like we, we, I, my, and so I left my car at the church, and it was fall. It was actually a hot fall. It was one of the warmest falls we'd had in a really long time. And, and so um, my dad picked up the car Friday and drove it Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What, um, what you don't know about my dad possibly is my, my father has no sense of smell. He, he, he can't smell things. And Sunday night when I got in the car with him, when I opened the door, an aroma hit me. And what had happened was one of the tubes of hamburger, Zoe had gotten it out and, and, and she was storing it for later and had shoved it under the seat and that thing had started to swell in the heat and it burst and all the juices and all the meat was flying down into the carpet of my mother's van that I had driven. So I did what I think every male in my situation would do. I threw it away, I drove home, I shut the door, and I went in the house. <laughs> and I was awoken the next Monday morning by a yell from my mother that was, you know, moms hit pitches, right? Where like garage doors were opening all over the neighborhood, right? And I walk out, and she's saying, Aaron, what did you do to my car? I didn't do anything. What is the smell? Oh, did you notice that? Yes, I noticed it. Fix it. And she took my car and left. And I was stuck with a minivan that smelled to drive to school. So I drove to school. I came back. And I did what I think every male in my situation would do. I sprayed for breeze. I shut the door, and I left. The next morning, I hear the same yell. Aaron, what did you do? Well, I fixed it. You did not fix it. So this time, I opened the door. I sprayed for breeze. I put uh, baking powder on the floor. I shut the door. I left. Not good enough. So my mom says, Aaron, it is not enough to just try to cover the smell. You got to get rid of the source. And so I had to go home. I had to take out all of the seats. I had to take out all of the carpet that was allowed. I had to shampoo it three or four times. I had to put up stuff more. I had to shampoo it. I had to Febreze it. I had to shampoo it. And eventually I had to get all of that juice and all of that mess and all of the stench of rancid hamburger out of the van before my mother would drive it. And when we have this radical shift of nature— when we truly encounter God and the Spirit of God dwells within us, the stench of sin is no longer appropriate. And if we're not careful, our gospel is sin management. We just Febreze it. I'm a good person. I'm a moral individual. Maybe we even throw some baking soda on the floor. And God wants to do so much more for us than that. The gospel of Jesus is that a new kingdom has started and we as citizens start to live as joint heirs of the princes of that kingdom. And that because we have encountered him, life looks different. So today I try to gospel the gospel to you. That Christ has come. That Christ has died. That Christ was resurrected and he appeared to many. And through his spirit he can appear to us. And when that happens, the journey that you will be on is like nothing that you have ever experienced before. It is more fulfilling, more powerful. It is more peaceful and more joyful than anything the kingdoms of the world can give you. That is the gospel. That is the good news. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are thankful. Lord, we are thankful that you are not just interested in forgiving our past, but you are interested in directing our future. Lord, the gospel is not simply about you, Jesus. You are the gospel. You are the incoming of the kingdom of God. And we as Christians, we as, as little Christ, as representatives of you, 
Lord, the same power that conquered the grave can now live in us. Sin has no victory. Death has no sting. Because we've met you. And we have been adopted into your family. And when everything else is shaken, when everything else is crazy, when we don't know where we're going to go when we graduate, when we don't know who we're going to marry, when we don't know what we're going to do for lunch, God, when, when everything around us is in shambles, when, when we have deconstructed our life to the point that we don't know what to believe, we can hold on to the bedrock of our faith. We can stand on the gospel, and that is you. May we never let go of you because we know you will never let go of us. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray.